Hello everyone and welcome to our last lecture in the geology unit and that is um, geologic time. Uh, geologic time is the, the thing that geologists have really kind of contributed you know, to humanity's understanding of itself in the big picture. You know, the idea that the earth is very, very old and people are really just kind of the tip of the proverbial iceberg, um, you know, is is shocking to a lot of people and, and was something that took people a long time to come to terms with, really. Um, if you do find yourself interested in this kind of thing, um, advance the slide, advance the slide. There we go. Uh, there's a really good book by Marsha. Good luck with that last name. Marsha uh, has written a really good book called Timefulness, um, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World. So uh, it's not too thick. It's a really good book. Um, so if you are interested in geology and the reckoning of geologic time, um, it is a great book. So so uh, before we can jump into this, though, we need to talk about the concept. And that concept is uniformitarianism, which I am just going to call uniformity because it's a lot easier to say. Um, uniformity is the assumption that the, uh, the processes that are operating in the world today are the same as those that were operating in the past. I know I said it, I said it the opposite of what the first bullet point says, but it doesn't really matter, right? And so the way that we really think about this is um, the rules don't change, right? The, the, the laws, the underlying laws of chemistry and physics that govern everything haven't changed. This is an assumption, but it's an assumption that everyone makes. I mean, everyone, not just scientists, right? You don't wake up in the morning wondering whether or not there's still going to be gravity. No, you assume there is, right? You don't you know, go to start your car and wonder if the ideal gas law is still in effect, which is how your internal combustion engine works. Or if you're driving an electric car, you're, you know, do electrons still flow through wires? I don't know. Well, of course they do, right? Everyone assumes this. Um, um, you know, every scientist assumes this. Uh, it was first really put into words by the guy down here on the left, a Scottish geologist named Hutton. Hutton was a brilliant geologist, but a terrible writer. And everyone was like, I believe his first name was James. Uh, everyone was like, um, James, Jim, um, don't we all kind of know that? What, what's your point? You know, he, he never really did get the point across here. And I'm not either yet. But um, And then the idea, though, would be picked up by the guy on the right here, Charles Lyell, um, who would basically found the modern science of geology based on this principle of uniformity. Now, you know, I think probably every geology class I have ever taken, at some point the professor has mentioned uniformity. Uh, but, you know, I took a lot of chemistry classes, I took a lot of physics classes, I took a lot of other science classes, no one cares, right? No one cares um they just don't uh it's just not a big deal no one you know no one teaching chemistry goes okay you know here's this and oh by the way you know 10 million years ago it would still be that you know no no yeah, of course it is right this this is so baked in to how we think about the world that we don't ever think about it we just don't ever think about it so why do geologists explicitly Think about it all the time. Well, they do because of this guy, uh, Cardinal James Usher of the Anglican Church of England. And I want to say in the 14 or 1500s, um, he picked up his Bible and he started flipping backward and adding up numbers, right? And so he says, well, look, Jesus was 33, I think, years old when he was crucified, so let's start there. And so, you know, uh, his mom was this old, his dad was this old, and flip backward and flip backward and back and back and back, adding up numbers and adding up numbers and adding up numbers until he got a date uh, of about 6,000 years B.C. or 
you know, I don't know, about 6,000 years. I, th I think it's a total of 6,000 years, so that would be 5,000-something uh, or 4,000-something B.C. Yeah, so, um, and, and look, um, you know, and I, I know, you know, um, okay, first of all, there might be people listening to this who are, yeah, the Earth is 6,000 years old, right? This guy is why you think that. Okay, the, the, he he was he's his guy who who did that work. Now he's not the only guy who did that work. Actually, Johannes Kepler did that. Is that about the same number? Um, um, Isaac Newton did that. Right about the same number. Turns out if you do that, you get about six thousand years old for the age of the Earth, give or take, because you are going to have to make some assumptions along the way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But anyway, Usher was very well connected politically, and so his number became the number. And for a long time, um, you know, there were Bibles printed with his little dates in the margin, you know. And then, you know, uh, about, what, 4,000 B.C., God said, let there be light, and that was the beginning. And so, um, here's the problem, though. Let's just look at some rock, right? So, and let's just think, because we're going we're gonna to be doing this throughout the entire lecture. And so, let's just think about this. Um, what does it take to get this rock to look like this, right? Well, first, this is all shale. So, uh, shale's deposited underwater, so sea level needed to be a bit higher back then. And so, first, we deposit the shale, we deposit the shale, we deposit all of the shale. Well, that shale is tilted, and it was not tilted to start with, so something had to tilt it. So some kind of tectonic deformation tilts the shale. We'll talk more about all of this later. But anyway, some sort of tectonic deformation tilts the shale. Sea level is going to have to fall. And then we're going to have to erode that surface right there flat. And so we do that. And then sea level is going to have to rise again to deposit this um, on top of it. And then sea level is going to have to fall again to get this erosion. And then finally, and who knows how much rock used to be up there, how much rock used to be up there that we don't even see. And then sea level finally falls and we have the rock there sitting there like that, right? There is no way that can happen in 6,000 years. There's just not. I mean, I mean, it's it's just, it's just, and, and that's just some rock in some farmer's field, right? That's not even. Do I have it? Let me see. Yeah, that's not even like you know the Grand Canyon, right? I mean, imagine how much you know time it would take to not only deposit all that rock, but then for the Colorado River to weather its way down through it, right? That alone takes five to ten million years, right? And much less the rock. So, so yeah, so so you know, as geologists start looking around, they're like, look, guys. If we're going to keep the rules of, you know, chemistry and physics and basically the laws of science intact, the Earth is going to be pretty dang old. Now, they didn't know how old, but they, they, they realized that they just didn't have the time to get everything done if the Earth was 6,000 years old. Now, look, I'm aware that... Um, I'm probably explicitly bumping up against some some people's religion right now, and uh, that's fine. We're not going to debate anything. I mean, you are free to believe or not believe anything I say at any time, okay? Um, but I'm just telling you the science, right? You you can choose to believe or not believe it. I'm I, I don't really have a dog in that fight at all. Um, if you're struggling with that a little bit, I can recommend some really good books <laughs> uh, that might help you kind of reconcile these things in your mind. But um. But, you know, but, but, you know, now, now, so if you, if your faith requires that you believe that the earth is 6,000 years old and God, you know, miracled those rocks into place and okay, that that's fine. But, you know, miracling something into place is kind of by definition breaking the rules, right? You're, you're calling off the rules of, of nature to get that to happen, right? So if we keep the rules in place, the earth gets really old. So as geologists started doing their work, they immediately started bumping up against this 6,000 year number. And um, they immediately uh, realized that if uniformity is a thing, and it is, we don't call off the rules, then the earth is very old. So this is why geologists in particular, we worry a great deal about uniformity. Uh, we just We just kind of do... No one else seems to care, but we do. We care a lot. So anyway, okay, so Grand Canyon, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. So when we think about geologic time, there's two different things that we worry about. 
relative dating and absolute dating, right? And so, or relative time and absolute time. So relative time is kind of what I did back here, right? I said, okay, first this happened, then that happened, then we tilted it, then we eroded it, then we did this and we did that, right? That's relative dating or relative time, right? I have no idea how old that rock is. That's just some picture I found on the internet. Okay, I, I do not know how old that rock is. If we want to know how old that rock is, I'm sure there's a fossil in that shale. I'd go look for fossils and work it out that way. That's about the best way you're going to do it. But um, but no, I have no idea, right? But I do know the story, right? I do know the sequence of events, right? That is, once again, um, relative time or relative dating, okay? Absolute dating is a little more straightforward, maybe. It's how old is the rock? Right. Here's some rock. How old is it? Right. Not, you know, well, it came after this rock or before that one. How old is the rock? Right. That that's that is um, that's absolute dating or absolute time. That's going to require an understanding of radioactivity, which isn't going to happen for a while. OK, so so, yeah. So um, now the first kind of um, geologic time that geologists did was uh, relative dating or relative time. So let's talk about that first. Then we'll talk about absolute dating or absolute time. Okay, so to understand relative dating or relative time, we want to turn our attention to one particular scientist, uh, Will Smith. Oh, wait, no, not that Will Smith. Okay, sorry, that guy, Will Smith. Yeah, I know. Anyway, Will Smith. Um, I just can't help myself, guys. Sorry. But anyway, Will Smith. Uh, Will Smith was a, um, a geologist in England. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, he really was. But Will Smith was very solidly um, middle class um, um, in, you know, class conscious, class conscious England, um, you know, around the time of the Industrial Revolution. And so, um, and uh, so he actually had to work for a living. And what he did was he built canals. He was a genius at getting water to move from one place to another. Now you're thinking, wait a second, that's not hard, right? Dig a hole, it fills up with water, make it a long wide hole and there it's a canal yeah in florida right he's in england with hills and mountains and things right and he needs to do this the reason he needs to do this, like i said this is around the time of the industrial revolution and so there's a lot of coal up here i'll use this map of england uh just for a second here there's a lot of coal up here in the north of england and there's a lot of factories down here in the south of england right and so, although they would probably call that Scotland, but anyway, um, and so he's got to got to get that coal from here down to here. Well, how are you going to do that, right? Now, look, you know, not railroads, no, right? Not not trucks, okay? Barges, right? Big flat boats pulled by donkeys, right? Okay, so if you're going to have a big flat boat pulled by a donkey, you need a canal, and if you need a canal, Will Smith is your guy, right? And so he traveled all over. England digging canals and paying attention to the rocks. He wasn't, I mean, and you know, he and his crews, he, he would, he would look, he collected fossils, he collected rocks, he cataloged things, he did all kinds of stuff, right? And he produced in the end, the first geologic map of England, which you see over there on the right, which makes it the first geologic map of anywhere, uh, and, and instituted a lot of the, uh, <coughs> sorry i'm not dying i promise instituted a lot of the the things that we do today right using different colors for different rock types um 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 you know draw you know we've been doing this right drawing cross sections through rocks and looking at them from the side to get a sense for how how things are arranged right things that we do to this day uh it was really 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 good geologist um he was unfortunately like i said you know middle to lower middle class and um he published this map and everyone stole it everyone's they're just like hey cool map will here i'm gonna take it and put my name on it and uh he just he got cut out of everything um he made some bad investments he ended up in in debtor's prison 
at one point. Uh, it, it was just he really led a very very difficult life. You know, at a time when you know, you know, British geology was you know done by you know aristocrats in, sitting in big overstuffed leather chairs you know, sipping brandy, smoking cigars, and thinking about what the rocks out there must look like. Uh, Will Smith was actually out there in the rock, uh, and he was, he was a fantastic, fantastic geologist. His friends would bail him out of debtor's prison, pay his debts for him, and finally, late in life, he got, um, his work was finally recognized, and he got a pension from the king, uh, and he was able to live out his life uh, in relative comfort uh, after living a very difficult life uh, and so and being really hard done by by a lot of people I'm a huge fan of Will Smith in case you haven't figured that out so anyway um, it's him uh, who we have to thank for a lot of these principles because he he put the rocks in order at least the rocks in England in order and that's what we're about to learn to do so okay so um, here's what I'd like you to do pause the video and go and either print out or bring up in another window or something the lab okay it's unlocked by the time you're seeing this it's called geologic time uh because what i'm going to do is as i talk we're going to do the lab kind of together <laughs> okay so uh so that by the time i'm done with this uh lecture you'll have just a couple more things to do and you'll be done okay uh i found you know, if we were doing this face to face i would do it the same way i would just be staring at you so so let's uh so so go ahead pause the video go um either bring up or print out the lab okay okay i'll wait Okay, we're back. Okay, so here we go. Um, what are these right? What are these um, ideas right that let us put rocks in order? Well, they really are just kind of quote unquote common sense. Okay, only you know common sense kind of has a way of ganging up on us and uh, making our life difficult. But but it really does kind of start slow. Um, superposition. So superposition just says look. In an undisturbed sequence of sedimentary rock, the older rocks on the bottom, the younger rocks on the top. It's that simple. Okay. If it's undisturbed and sedimentary, the older rock will be on the bottom, the younger rock will be on the top. Right. So let me get rid of the words. So here we are out at the Grand Canyon. All right. And so um, we'll look at the Grand Canyon a bit today because um, it's a good example of a lot of things. Right. And so, you know, so everything that you see here, I believe uh, mostly everything. Yeah. Not this, not that, but everything you see up here, the well lit stuff up here is all sedimentary. Right. So once I lay down a sandstone, right, the next sedimentary rock has to come on top of it. Right. There's no way I can I can lay down, you know, this rock here and then slide that sedimentary rock underneath it, right? That's not gonna work. That's not gonna work at all, right? The next sedimentary rock has to go on top of it, right? If I'm in class right now, I lay down a book and I say, there's a sedimentary rock. And I say, okay, look, the next sedimentary rock has to go on top of that one and I put another book on top of that right and then the next sedimentary rock has to go on top of that and I put another book on top of that and then the next one has to go on top of that etc etc so we have a pile of books okay so oldest ones on the bottom youngest ones on the top okay but later on I can bring a granite up underneath it right later on you know my sedimentary rock can be sitting there and i can bring a granite up underneath that sedimentary rock okay so this this rule only applies to sedimentary rock okay so um so yeah it doesn't apply to igneous rock we'll have another rule for igneous rock here in a minute so once again looking at the words if I have an undisturbed sequence of sedimentary rock, the older rock's on the bottom and the younger rock is on the top. Okay? All right. So, um, look at your lab. Look at number one. Okay? This is trivially easy. Okay? But, uh, so, on number one, what is the sequence of letters 
right? That's going to uh, give us the order of those rocks from the oldest rock to the youngest rock. Take five seconds and either type or write it in there, okay? Five seconds. Okay, so what, what the, what's the oldest rock, right? The oldest rock is A, right? What comes after A? F, right? What comes after F? C, right? And then what comes after C? E, right? So that's the sequence of rock there, okay? Alrighty, now, number two, let me see, can I do this? Yeah, okay, so number two, um, it's tilted, okay? So let's, let's go back to the PowerPoint and learn about rock that's been tilted, Okay, so uh, here we go, and um, <laughs> yep, 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 yeah, there. Okay, sorry. When we see rock that's tilted, we have to take in mind something called the principle of original horizontality, right? And this is just the idea that rock layers are deposited flat or horizontally, right? This is Horseshoe Canyon. In Arizona if you're a fan of those old John Ford John Wayne Westerns you know all about Horseshoe Canyon okay I mean they you know there's so many cowboy movies there's a shot of the cowboy standing by the canyon just I mean it's just over and over again well anyway the reason I'm showing you this is because the rock is flat if the rock is flat right here let's go back to that picture of the Grand Canyon right rock is flat it was deposited flat it's still flat it's flat right original horizontality really only becomes important there's another shot of the grand canyon only becomes important when the rock is not flat right when the rock has been deformed because that means that something deformed it right and so when geologists see rock like this it's kind of messed up right we know that something messed it up Okay, that something had to, some sort of tectonic force had to fold this rock. This rock was not, let me get my pointer, this rock was not deposited like this. Okay, it just wasn't. Okay, so so something had to fold. And so that's an event. That's an event that we need to think about. This is a beach in Portugal. Okay, and you can see this now not up here that rock is flat and we'll talk about this uh in just a bit here but you can see how you know this rock has been you know pretty severely folded there's some people by the way for scale and so you can see how this rock has been really really folded and that's an event so if we're working out a sequence of events first you know if this is all sedimentary and it is you know first the rock on the bottom and now you're gonna have to work out where the bottom is probably down here younger 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 as you go up and then there was tectonic deformation in this case some pretty serious compression that folded the rock that deformed the rock okay and so yeah so let's we'll come to cross-cutting relationships here in a second but let's go back to the lab so look at number two okay the or so let's assume that you know that this is this is that you know this end is up right and this end is but it hasn't been completely flipped over um and uh so so let's let's ask ourselves okay which rock is older which rock is younger and then what happened all right okay so let's take 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 five seconds work out which rock is younger older which rock is younger and then then what happened okay so five seconds okay so the old what's the oldest rock the oldest rock is O. right it's on the bottom okay that's a cross bedded sandstone these little patterns by the way mean something to a geologist um and then uh, the, the next youngest rock after that is going to be Q. And the next one after that is going to be C, right? And then the one after that is that limestone X. C is a sandstone and Q is a shale, by the way. And then A is the youngest rock out there. Uh, that's, a, that's a sandstone with a conglomerate on the bottom. Um, and so then what happened after that? Tilting, right? That rock was originally deposited flat then it was tilted okay okay so um all right so uh let's think a little bit about uh some other things because we need to understand what to do with igneous rocks we need to understand what to do with faults and we also need to understand what to do with erosion surfaces so yeah so uh if we want to think about faults or igneous um 
intrusions, then we need something called the principle of cross-cutting relationship, right? And so the idea here is if I have a fault or an igneous intrusion cutting across a rock, it is younger than the rock it cuts, right? I hate the words common sense, but this kind of is common sense, right? The um, the fault or the intrusion has to, you know, sorry, right, wait a second. The rock has to exist before it can be faulted, right? You can't fault thin air, okay? You can't push igneous rock into thin air, right? And so you can see a fault here, by the way, normal or reverse. Think about it. Think about it while I get my pen up. Yeah, I'm going to use my pen, y'all. Hold on. Okay, normal or reverse? Okay, well, look at this coal bed right here, right? Here's here's the fault running right down through there. That's the hanging wall. That's the foot wall, right? And so this coal bed should come out here. I can't draw, but that's okay. It's been dropped down, right? So that one is normal, right? The head wall moved down down relative to the foot wall so that's a normal fault okay now for our work today still gotta find that hot key to do this for our work today we just ask ourselves what's the sequence of events right well okay it's all sedimentary so we're good with with just superposition we got a fault so we'll use cross-cutting relationships right and so so we say okay first this rock down here this sandstone with root casts in it and then the coal above it, the root cast came from the plants and the coal. I have a thing for drawing these, but anyway. And then um, and then uh, cross bedded sandstone with the conglomerate on the bottom. Let me switch back so you can see me pointing a little bit better. Cross bedded sandstone, conglomerate on the bottom. So first this, then that, then that, then that limestone here, then that shale there, then that sandstone there. And then, uh, faulted, right? All that rock is cut by the fault. So first all the rock, bottom to top, then the fault right okay real world kingman tough uh outside of um, um in arizona okay um a uh, couple things to see here first thing see this that's a riverbed that's an ancient riverbed see how it's conglomerate remember when we talked about rocks and i said that um that conglomerates form in rivers that is an ancient riverbed okay there's another one up there there's another one up there, but all the rest of this is volcanic ash, okay? And it's faulted. So if we ask ourselves, which came first, the fault or the ash? The ash, right? First the rock, bottom to top, then the fault, okay? So as we're looking at this, normal or reverse? I, I, know, I know you're sick of it, but normal or reverse, okay? Take a minute. Look, maybe right here is a good spot to look, right there, okay? So... It's normal again, right? This white bed comes across here, should come out there. It didn't, it got dropped down. This is on top of the fault. That's the head wall. The head wall slid down, right? Now, this is kind of interesting because when I was first looking at this, I'm like, yeah, those are all normal faults. Normal, yeah, that makes sense. Then I looked at this and I was like, this, this fault right here. And I was like, wait a second. That one's reverse because that goes there and that got shoved up that's reversed i'm like things don't do that right they don't they, things don't do that uh, you don't have a whole bunch of normal faults and then one reverse fault right the, the conditions that produce normal faults are going to make normal faults you don't just turn it around then i realized i'd mismatched the bed this doesn't go with that this goes with this right it that actually goes down under the road there but th th look look carefully that and that they don't really match I mean white, they don't really match, but this matches that really well. So yeah, that's the head wall. Uh, drop down, way down. There's quite a few feet. Right here, let me get my pencil. I know, I know. Bear with me. Humor me. Okay, so right, this this white bed here should come out over here, but it's been dropped all the way down to there. Okay. So pretend that's a line, right? Ooh, I drew a line. I didn't even mean to. I have no idea how I did that, guys. But anyway, so um, that down, right? So so another another normal fall. Okay. Um,
here's some igneous intrusions that show us how this works with igneous intrusions, right? So as I look here, I've got three rocks. I've got the darker rock. I've got the light. Let me let me get my pointer back. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, there we go. I've got the darker rock. I've got the light pink rock, and I've got the dark pink rock, right? And so if I look at this, the lighter pink crosses the dark, so this has to be younger right and then the darker pink crosses the lighter pink so this has to be younger right and so between these three rocks one two and three right the the oldest rock is this one the next oldest one is the light pink and then this one right so if i'm putting these in order one two three right same thing over here one two the little one and then three right this cuts everything so this has to be there first then the little one, then that one, right? Down here, I have something similar. I deposit all this. Then I push that in. Then I push that in, right? And so, um, and so yeah, so this is how cross-cutting relationships work with, with igneous intrusion, right? So um, here's another fault. We've already seen this. I uh, don't really need to talk about this. Why is my picture offset? Anyway, um, this is that normal fault I showed you before, right? So first the rock, then the fault, right? You cannot fault rock that doesn't exist. First the rock, if it's sedimentary, bottom to top, then the fault. Uh, oh, that's why I offset it. Okay, so here's another one uh, with a little, little right lateral fault here, right? So first I've got this granite. Then I push this intrusion into it. Then I fault the intrusion, right? Right lateral because if I stand here, and I look across, it's moved to the right. If I stand here, face the other direction, look across, it's moved to the right. Face the other direction. Pick your computer up and turn the monitor around or something if you have to. Face the other direction, it's off to the right. Okay? Alrighty. Uh, now, here's, here's the thing. Um, faults are younger than the rock they cut, but they're older than the rock they don't cut. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, here we're back at the Bishop Tuff again, and there's a lava flow on top of it, right? Notice, though, that all these faults stop at the lava flow, right? And so, if I do, if I, I think I, I think I drew the fault in, yeah, so there's the fault, right? So, um, once again, that's a normal fault, okay? Uh, so, there's the fault, but notice how it doesn't cut the lava, right? So, it, so it doesn't cut the lava, right? So, so, if I'm putting all of this in order, I go, okay, first the sedimentary rock, bottom to top, so first that, then that, then that, 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 then I cut it, fault it, right? Then I put the lava flow on top of it, right? Because, look, this, this lava is not offset by that fault. So first the fault happened, then the lava happened, okay? Alrighty, uh, so let's take a look at our exercise again. And so first of all, number three here, okay? So I've got a sandstone. I've got a cross-bedded sandstone with some conglomerate on the bottom. I've got a shale. I've got a limestone. I've got a cross-bedded sandstone. I've got a, um, a coal there. Oh, and then I've got M. M is the erosion surface, right? M is kind of like this, right? M is that surface where it got eroded. It's called an unconformity, and we'll talk more about unconformities later. And then on top of that, we've got uh, that sandstone T, okay? So so, um, so take a few seconds and work out what happened here, okay? Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm not gonna pause the video or anything. I'm just gonna wait a few seconds, and then we'll go through it. So work out what happened there. Okay, so what happened? Okay, so let me get a cursor somewhere or another. Man, I should have got a cursor before. I don't know if I can get it. Can I get a cursor? Let's see. Can I get a cursor? No. Okay, I'll just we'll just say it. I won't type it because apparently I can't do that. Okay, so um, okay, so what what's the oldest rock? It's all sedimentary. It's all sedimentary. What's the oldest rock? It's going to be C, right? What comes after C? Next rock up, right? A. Okay, by the way, that conglomerate there tells us that that is stratigraphically down. 
Um, if if that conglomerate was on the top, that we would know that that rock had been flipped completely over, and we would need to start at the top and go down. So yeah, we're good. So first C, then A, then what X, right? Then what R, then what S, right? Then O, good. Then I mean it's not part of the sequence, but tilting, right? <laughs> because this is not flat, so tilting. What happens then? M which is erosion, right? Taking, you know, this tilted rock and eroding it flat, right? Followed by what then? T, right? That 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 surface right there that is called, like I said, that's called an unconformity, and we'll talk about them here in just a minute. Um, now, number four involves an igneous intrusion, right? Number four involves some sedimentary rock, that's been cut, sorry, that's been cut by um, by an igneous rock, and that igneous rock is there, that's T, okay? Um, now, see these little hash marks I put around T? That is called a metamorphic halo, and what that means is that uh, this rock, when it was intruded, was hot enough to cook the rock around it, to do what's called thermal metamorphism, uh, and to actually alter the rock around it. So that tells us, when you see those hash marks, that tells you that rock was hot when it intruded up into that uh, surrounding rock, which we call the country rock. So, uh, now notice that T cuts across everything. So let's, uh, so let's work out the sequence of events. Let's take uh, five seconds and put them in order. So, Okay, so, uh, what comes first? Okay, once again, sedimentary rock, uh, superposition, bottom and top is fine, right? And so, M is first, right? Uh, what comes after M? R, right? What comes after R? S, right? What comes after S? Q, okay? And then T cuts everything, so T has to be the youngest rock out there, right? So, in this case, it's M, R, S, Q, and then, and then T, okay? Um, okay, so uh, fairly straightforward now, uh, a fault, okay? Uh, I won't obsess over this too much, but what kind of fault is it? Reverse, right? This one's reverse. See, here's the head wall. It's moved up relative to the foot wall, right? This is this this is moved up, right? Just slid that way, okay? So, um, okay, so what about now? What's, okay, so take five seconds and put those in order. Okay, so I can type again. So what's the oldest rock out there? M, right? What comes after M? X. What comes after X? R, right? What comes after R? A, right? And then what comes after A? Finally, O, right? O cuts everything. Okay, now, this one's a little bit different, right? This is a lot like what we saw on the PowerPoint, only it's not igneous, but this is a lot like what we saw on the PowerPoint, right? Because remember that faults are younger than what they cut, but they're older than what they don't cut, okay? So um, so let's take, once again, take five seconds and let's uh, let's think about this one, five seconds. Okay, I gave you 10. Okay, so, okay. Okay, so what's the oldest rock? I can type again, so I will. What's the oldest rock? It's going to be D, right? Followed by what? Followed by L, right? M cuts L, so M has to come after L, right? And then what comes after that? Well, M also cuts B, so we got to do B first. B has to be there before, before it can be faulted, right? So then B, then what happens, right? Then we fault it with M, right? Then we fault it with M. Then what happens? Then erosion cuts down through, and we and that's T. Okay, let me get let me get T on the right side of M there. So then we get T, right? And then what happens? Then A, right? This is how we do this. Okay, you find a way to figure out what's going on from the side, and you work it out. Okay, now um, one more. Two more, but one more I'm going to do for you, and then I'm going to cut you loose for another one. Um, and so, okay, so what we have here is we have N, which is uh, those squiggly lines mean it's a sedimentary rock. It's a schist, okay? Um, P is a granite, 
okay? And then T, which is a very unfortunate letter that I chose for this because it looks a lot like the symbols here, is actually a different kind of granite, okay? So I've got I've got metamorphic rock, I mean, I've got two igneous rocks, right? Superposition is no help here. The younger rock is not on the top and the older rock is not on the bottom. We need purely cross-cutting relationships, okay? Now, notice that P burned in. That's what that metamorphic halo there means, okay? Also, notice that T burned P. That's what that metamorphic halo there means, okay? So, in this case, really, take five seconds and, and let's, uh, let's do this one, okay? Okay, so, once again, superposition, no help, okay? But, P burned in and T burned P, right? T actually burned everything. It burned P and in, right? So that means that's got to be the youngest, okay? And if this burned that, then that had to be there. So that makes in the oldest rock out here, right? And then P intruded its way up into in. And then T cut its way across across P and across in, okay? Now, interestingly, guys, this is kind of fun. Um... When archaeologists, okay, when geologists do this, we do it the way we're doing it, right? We start at the bottom and we work our way up. We work in the direction that time goes, okay? When archaeologists do this, they start at the top and go down. They, they, their, their sequence here would go, would be opposite ours. They would go A, T, M, B, L, D. They would go backward through time, right? It's, it's just the way they think. Um, and so, um, so if as you're doing this, and I'm about to cut y'all loose to do this one yourself, as you're doing this, you know, if, if you're like, if you get stuck, Go up to the top and work backward, maybe. Okay, I mean, maybe you're an archaeologist. Okay, I've had students who are archaeologists, and they do it that way. It's just the way their brain works. It's really kind of funny. But anyway, um, so so yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn you loose on this one yourself. Okay, now let me. I I kind of made a mess of this in here. Okay, so let me explain this, and then I'll show you a couple other things. Okay, so first of all, um. First of all, this is a sandstone H. It is cut by this fault here, M, which also cuts that coal there, E, but it doesn't cut that unconformity there, T, right? T is this squiggly line right here, that, un that erosion, that unconformity, which we'll talk more about here in a minute. Um, and like I said, E is the coal, M is the fault that cuts the coal and the sandstone, and H is the sandstone. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is it is all sedimentary except for A. A is a granite. A has pushed its way through H, E, T, S, but it stops at O. All right, so keep that in mind. Like I said, superposition, um, you know, um, Start at the bottom, work your way up. Keep in mind that, you know, faults are younger than the things they cut and older than the things they don't cut. Igneous intrusions have to be younger than the rock they burn, right? And so, uh, and so, you know, rock has to exist before you can intrude something in it. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to actually pause this because I smell um, lunch. My mom had lunch ready. So I'm going to pause this. We'll pick back up. We're going to talk about one more, um, one more um, relative dating technique. And then we're going to get a little bit into radiometric dating. So, uh, so go ahead and do that. And I will be back. Well, I'm going to pause the recording. So I'll be back in one second. Okay. Bye. Okay, I'm back. Mom made beefaroni. It was yummy. Okay, so, um, I know, 53 years old and my mom's making me beefaroni. What can I say? Anyway, okay, so, um, did you get it? Awesome. Okay, so we need to do, we need to learn how to do radiometric dating, but first there's one other thing, uh, that we use when we're doing, um, when we're doing, um, relative dating, and that is the idea of an inclusion. And so what an inclusion is, is it is a piece of one rock inside of another rock. And so you can see here, let me get my pointer going. 
you've got a piece of uh, what looks like diorite inside of uh, looks like an andesite around it, right? And so when you have a piece of one rock inside of another, the inclusion, the piece, this, this, this here. Okay, hold on, let me, hold on, let me draw. <laughs> okay, so oh, draw, 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 draw. Mm, there we go. Let's say when you have an inclusion, the inclusion, that's this bit here, right? The inclusion is older than the rock around it, right? So this is older. Oh, that's not a bad. Oh, and um, and this is younger, right? The inclusion has to exist. Ooh, look at that. The inclusion has to exist before it can be included into the other rock, right? And so so inclusions are older than the rock around them. Okay, and what's on my finger erasing? There we go. And there we go. Um, erase, erase, erase. There we go. So. Take the words away. <clears throat> so, between these two rocks, the diorite, the one in the middle, let me get my pointer back, the one in the middle is older, the one around it is younger, right? Um, we can go to here, right? This basalt here is older, the granite around it is younger, right? The inclusion has to exist before it can be included in the rock around it. Um, you know, and, and this... <laughs> It seems obscure, but it really can matter. Uh, let's just think about a case really quick, and then we'll move on to radiometric dating. And that is, let's say that um, I have a sandstone butted up against a granite, right? So, so, so superposition is no help here, right? Because it is entirely possible that this granite came up underneath that sandstone and is therefore younger than the sandstone, right? It is also possible, though, that the granite was sitting there minding its own business, and the sandstone was deposited on top of it, which would make it older, right? Think Stone Mountain, right? There sits Stone Mountain, okay? And then sea level rises, and then we deposit a sand on top of it, right? So I have granite, sandstone, granite's older, sandstone's younger, or... The sandstone could be sitting there and the granite could work its way up underneath it as magma and then cool when it reaches the bottom of the sandstone. So which is it? How do you tell? Well, one way is look for inclusions. Okay, if the sandstone was sitting there, right, and that granite came up underneath it as, you know, magma, then there's going to be pieces of that sand broken off into that granite. And so you will have inclusions of sandstone in your granite. Remember, the inclusion is older, right? The sandstone is older. So, you know, if I see this inclusion in here, I know that the sandstone was there before, before the granite. If, on the other hand, it looks like this. If I've got pieces of granite in my sandstone, that means that the granite was sitting there first. Then the sandstone was deposited on top of it and pieces of the granite were ripped up into the sandstone and it ends up looking like that, right? And so I know it's like that old commercial, your chocolate's in my peanut butter, your peanut butter's in my chocolate. But, you know, if the granite's in the sandstone, that means one thing. If the sandstone's in the granite, that means another thing. And they're very different things. If you, you know, if you if if you think that the granite was there and the sandstone got deposited on top of it, that means that you're going to have to jack sea level up. You're going to have to deposit that sandstone and everything on top of it. Then you're going to have to jack sea level back down to expose it, right? Don't get that wrong. Don't get that wrong. If you're out there talking about sea level getting jacked up and down and all this, and all that happened was the sandstone was sitting there and the granite came up underneath it, you you probably shouldn't be a geologist. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, no, don't just, just don't don't get that wrong. Don't get that wrong. So, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, and I'm not even going to worry about that. I'm not even sure why that's there. And so um, <clears throat> I mentioned unconformities briefly. Um, an unconformity, remember, is... Um, this erosion surface, right? And what it is, is a gap in the rock record, right? It is an interval of time that in, a, in one location that we don't have a rock record for, right? When what we know here, we know there is erosion during an unconformity, but that's it, right? What we know is this rock was deposited, it was deformed, and then there was erosion for who knows how long at this particular location. And then we put that sandstone on top of it, right? And so that's what an unconformity is, is it is this surface that represents a gap in the rock record, okay? So, so you know, 
if we think about i took the words away it doesn't matter so if we think about how to do this let, let's just let's just think about this for a second so so this is some of the oldest rock in florida this is the cross florida barge canal okay up north of homosassa springs if this this is highway 19 that bridge right there is highway 19. Um, it's some of the oldest rock in Florida on the surface. It's about 40 million years old, right? If I was to lay down a fresh layer of sandstone, so let's 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 raise sea level, right? Here you wouldn't need to do it, but about 10 feet, right? Raise sea level, deposit a fresh layer of sand on top of this 40 million year old limestone in the rock record, then I would have a 40 million year gap. I'm not a. I'm sorry. A, uh, yeah, a 40 million year gap. Sorry, I spaced on how old that rock is. Um, I'd have about a 40 million year gap. Okay. Um, you know, we could do it with older rock, right? This is the, um, this is the Horseshoe Canyon formation here in, in Canada. I was up here, um, a couple of, um, a couple summers ago looking for dinosaurs. And so if we look at this, um, you know, this rock is about 70 million years old, right? And so, and if I raise sea level again, like the Sundance Sea at the end of the Cretaceous, right, and cover this over with water, I'll lay a sandstone on top of here, and I'll have about a 70 million year gap between, let's say, you know, this and whatever sandstone is on top of it or whatever, right? And that that's the way these things form, right? This is the Canadian Shield. This is a few billion years old, this rock is, right? And so if I raise sea level... This is up around the Great Lakes region, by the way. If I raise sea level and deposit fresh rock on top of that, I've got a gap now of, you know, a couple billion years, right? Same thing here in Australia. Um, these banded iron formations, I've got one. I'd normally be holding it up right now in class, right? This is about three and a half billion year old rock. If I raise sea level, put a sand on top of it or something or a limestone or whatever, right? I've got a gap now between this rock and the hypothetical rock on top of it that is several billion years old. That's an unconformity. Um, here's what they look like in the rock record, right? I got a rock here, I got a rock here, I got a gap in between them. A lot of times unconformities are these very sharp divisions um, between the rock, right? Here's an unconformity here in the Grand Canyon between the Redwall limestone and the Muav limestone, Muav down here, the Redwall up here. They can be kind of difficult to spot sometimes if you don't really don't know what you're looking for. Here's another unconformity between the Vishnu schist here, and I don't know what on top of it, probably the Bright Angel Shale or something like that on top of it there. Um, a gap here between some metamorphic rock here and some sedimentary rock up here. Here's This is that beach in, in Portugal that we've been looking at with an unconformity here. This is called an angular unconformity. These are very easy to spot when you have that heavily tilted rock underneath that flat rock. Um, another angular unconformity. We've seen this one before, right? This was a little picture that I showed you when we were um, learning about the, the um, relative versus absolute dating. Um, and then this is the unconformity. This is Sakara Point, Scotland. I drew a line there along the unconformity. Um, between some rock down here going one way and some rock here going the other way, and the whole thing has been tilted after that. And so um, uh, this is where um, Hutton first kind of looked at this and went, huh, what the heck, and kind of, you know, did geology for, you know, one of the first times. So, so yeah, and then here's a fun one. This is actually in the parking lot of the Red Rocks Amphitheater. So I've got a sandstone over here that's 300 million years old. I've got a um, a nice over here that's 1.7 billion years old. And so right in there, you're missing what? About 1.4 billion years uh, just between that rock and that rock. And so, and so, yeah. So <clears throat> we get the rocks in order, right? Once you get the rocks in order and you start looking at the fossils, you can start dividing them up, right? First of all, there's a very long, what we now know is a long period of time, but we didn't know it was a long period of time before. But there's a period of time when there really aren't any obvious fossils. We call that the Precambrian. Uh, it turns out there are. It turns out there's fossils that go back about three and a half billion years. But, you know, nothing you look at, oh, look, a shell. No, 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 nothing like that. It's weird little squishy bacteria things and stuff like that. So we have a, a period of time here called the Precambrian. Then... Right here, uh, we have something called the Cambrian Explosion 
uh, which is basically things start making hard parts, right? Uh, they start making shells and bone and things like that that become incorporated into the fossil record. It's not that there's nothing back here. It's just we don't have any of it preserved because it was all like jellyfish and stuff, right? Weird, squishy things that tend to not be preserved. So you get this, you know, not an explosion of life, but an explosion of preserved life. And suddenly you get all these fossils. So now we expand this out here, and, you know, Paleozoic, Primitive Life, Mesozoic, Dinosaurs, and things like that, Cenozoic, uh, Mammals, and Flowering Plants, and Insects, and things. And then, you know, if you look even more carefully at the fossils, you realize that not all the dinosaurs lived at the same time, right? Um, you know, there were dinosaurs back here in the Triassic, different dinosaurs here in the Jurassic, different dinosaurs here in the Cretaceous, so we divide things up, right? Uh, back here, different different life forms at different times, and so we divide, you know, the Paleozoic up in the Cambrian, Ordovician, Slurian, Devonian, Mississippi, and Pennsylvania, Permian. Um, huge extinction there to clear the way for the dinosaurs, dinosaurs. Pretty good extinction here to clear the way for the mammals and mammals. So, uh, actually, mammals go back in here, but whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, so so here's the trick, right? Once you get the rocks in order, and then you start looking at the fossils, and you realize that not everything lived at the same time, right? They just didn't. Uh, there was this sort of progression of life through time. Now, this is not evolution, Evolution kind of explains why there's progression of life through time. This is just what's called faunal succession. This is just looking at the fossil record once you get the rocks in order and realizing that there is this sort of change in what lived on the earth through time. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, evolution explains why it changes, but the fact that it changes is kind of an observation. Um, and so, yeah, so, so now... We had the words, right? Cambrian, Ordovician, Slurian, Devonian, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, Tertiary, and Quaternary. And we can actually divide the Tertiary and the Quaternary into Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pliocene, Holocene. Uh, but we're not going to worry about that. Uh, but we had the words, right? Based on fossils, really. And so if you bring someone a rock, um, and say, okay, what is this? They're gonna, if it, and it has a fossil in it, they're gonna go, oh, well, that's Permian, because there, there's a, there's a Permian fossil in it, right? And you're gonna go, okay, great, how old is that? And they're gonna go, yeah, it's Permian. I don't know how old it is. It's Permian, that's what, you know, that's how old it is. You know, and to this day, honestly, when you ask a geologist or a paleontologist how old something is, odds are you're gonna get an answer like Silurian, okay? Not a number okay but for the longest time we didn't have the numbers we just didn't have the numbers and so um how do we get the numbers and more importantly maybe how do we get this number how do we get the number here which would be the age of the earth at a little over four and a half billion years right how do we get that uh and yeah so you know um i didn't realize i had this picture but that's okay so you can see here you can see here just a few species you can see how you know not everything lives at the same time um and the organisms that were living you know in the in the paleozoic are very different from the ones living in the mesozoic very different from the ones living in the cenozoic right there's this change through time of the fossils that we find of the organisms that we find and it is surprisingly you know orderly we don't find trilobite fossils up in here we just don't they're not there <laughs> and we don't find dinosaur fossils down in here right no 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 it, it all kind of proceeds apace and so yeah so how do we get the numbers well we, we have to understand absolute dating and in order to understand absolute dating we need to understand radioactivity and so this is all going to begin in 1903 when marie curie and her husband, but mostly Marie Curie, is going to um, is going to discover radioactivity. She will win the Nobel Prize in 1903 and 1911 uh, for her work in radioactivity. And guys, I just want to say, um, Marie Curie is even more awesome than you think she is. Um, I mean, you know, whenever people talk about women in science, Marie Curie's name always comes up. Um, but you know, look, even beyond that, she is the only person to win 
two Nobel Prizes in two different science fields. Okay. Uh, she won one in chemistry and one in physics. Now, fortunately, her work spans those two disciplines, but still, no one else has ever done that. A lot of people work in disciplines that span those fields. They haven't won two, one in chemistry and one in physics, but she did. Lots of people, a few people have won two Nobel Prizes. Linus Pauling won one in chemistry and one in a Nobel Peace Prize, right? Which is great, but that's not science. But so to this day, she remains the only person to have won two Nobel Prizes in two different science fields. During World War I, Marie Curie taught herself how to build automobiles because no one would teach her. Um, and she mounted mobile x-ray trucks on those automobiles and drove them into the battlefields of World War I, recruited women to do this. There's Marie Curie. There's her daughter. Uh, drove um, these trucks onto the battlefields of World War I to x-ray wounded soldiers and literally saved lives with her brain uh and you know world war one of course was you know the, the first real use of uh chemical warfare mustard gas and things like that so they, they were placing themselves in very very real danger uh for the sake of doing this and um and so it really it, she, she really was it's just just phenomenal um in a lot of different ways so she would win nobel prizes in 1903 and 1911 and then bertram boltwood of yale university uh would be the first person <coughs> Sorry, to successfully date a rock in 1907. Yes, dated a rock. You know, the rock's cute. You see if the rock wants to go to dinner. So no, okay, dated a rock. Sorry, guys, couldn't resist. Um, so anyway, 1907, Bertram Boltwood dates a rock. Uh, Yale University. Now, um, I know it sounds funny to say it, but um, but um, the Bertram Boltwood would tragically um suffer from depression, um, and take his own life uh just a few years later despite being a just brilliant um, geologist. I mean, I know that doesn't matter, but it's still, it's still tragic. So, 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 um, so that would kind of get the ball rolling. And then, um, Claire Patterson, um, in 1953 and George Tilton, um, would date the Diablo Canyon meteorite, um, to an age of about four and a half billion years old. The Diablo Canyon meteorite was the meteorite that caused um, this uh, th this uh, crater, Behringer Crater. Okay, the crater the crater is about fifty thousand years old. Uh, the the rock that made the crater, uh, pieces of it scattered everywhere when it hit. Um, what is about four and a half billion years old? So by nineteen fifty three, we had a you know a pretty good idea um, about how old the Earth was. Uh, you know if the, if you know. If the oldest materials in our solar system are about four and a half billion years old, then odds are our planet is about four and a half billion years old, too. Nowadays, we find zircons in rocks down in Australia and places like that. Rocks that are actually from the Earth that are four and a half billion years old. But so it's not until 1953, right? My mom was born in 1941, okay? So, you know, well, let's just say within my parents' generation, um... That, you know, that we've really understood how old the earth was. Uh, it's not easy to do. People tried all kinds of things that would not work. Uh, and so it was not until Claire Patterson and George Tilton came along to do this. It was a remarkable piece of chemistry. Uh, there's Claire Patterson sitting in front of the, the, uh, the line that you have to run to do this kind of work. And I have actually run vacuum lines like that. And it is not fun. It is a massive pain in the neck. Um, but uh, for a long time, and seriously, all until like, let's say 10 years ago, this is kind of how you did that. So, uh, so uh, but yeah, so, so, uh, so how do we do this? How, how, how do we do this, right? How do we date a rock? How do you you know, figure out how old a rock is. Well, we need, you know, like the first day of chemistry, right? So, atoms are made up of three things, protons, neutrons, electrons, right? Protons determine what the element is, right? Um, you know, hydrogen is hydrogen because it has one proton. If it has two protons, it's not hydrogen, it's helium, Okay, if it has three, it's lithium. If it has four, it's beryllium, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If it has eight, it's oxygen, right? On and on, right? And so, so 
And this is the atomic number and the number of protons determine what the element is. Okay, uh, let's skip to new. Let's skip. No, electrons are good. Electrons. Electrons go around the nucleus of the atom. Uh, I think I told you this before when we were talking about the photoelectric effect. But remember, even if there's only one electron, it is essentially a cloud around that nucleus, right? Um, it is a shell around that nucleus. Um, don't, don't think of it like the solar system with a planet going around the sun. It's very small. It's moving very near the speed of light. It is essentially everywhere all the time, okay? Even if there's only one. Um, if there's more than one, it's a cloud. Even if it's one, it's a cloud. Okay. So, but electrons are negatively charged. So they determine what the charge is, right? If you have the same number of protons and electrons, the element doesn't have a charge. If you take away electrons, the charge goes positive. If you add electrons, the charge goes negative. Okay. Now, the great unheralded <laughs> subatomic particle are neutrons. Neutrons, no one ever thinks about neutrons, except for maybe chemists and geologists, right? No one thinks about neutrons. Neutrons determine what the isotope is. It's basically a proton plus an electron, but that's not important. Neutrons exist in the nucleus of the atom, um, and they determine uh, what we call the isotope. Okay, so, so let's think about it this way. As you sit there right now, you are breathing oxygen, okay? There, you are breathing, though, two isotopes of oxygen. You are breathing O16, and you are breathing O18, okay? O18 has eight neutrons. Did I get that right? No. Sorry, I got that wrong. Take a breath, Paul. <sighs> okay. O18 has ten neutrons, right? Take the eight protons. Add the 10 neutrons together. 8 plus 10 is 18. O18 has 10 neutrons, right? There is, however, another isotope of oxygen that you are breathing. It's O16. O16 has 8 neutrons, right? Take the 8 protons that oxygen has, which makes it oxygen. Add the 8 neutrons to it, and you get O16. Okay, so um, you're breathing both. You're breathing both, and your body cannot tell the difference. Your body utterly cannot tell the difference, right? Most chemists don't worry about isotopes, okay? When they're using water, which is H2O, they don't care how much of that O is one isotope and how much of that O is another isotope. They just don't care, okay? Um, now, O16 and O18 are what we call stable isotopes. They'll stick around forever. It's not a problem, okay? Um, and there are uses for stable isotopes. Stable isotopes, I took a whole class in graduate school and nothing but stable isotopes, and they are very useful. We use them to take the temperature of the earth. We can use them to tell the salinity of ancient bodies of water. There's a lot to be done with stable isotopes, most definitely. We're not going to do any of it, okay? We're going to worry about unstable isotopes because here's the trick. Some combinations of protons and neutrons, for reasons that we will not go into, simply don't play well together, okay? And what's going to happen is that element is going to start spitting out subatomic particles. Um, this is what we call radiation. And those subatomic particles rip through your body, rip through your DNA, and can be very, very dangerous and very, very toxic, and they can kill you sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes they don't. It's just not a big deal. Okay. There, there's different kinds of radiation. Uh, some of it's dangerous. Some of it isn't. Some of it's somewhere in between. Okay. But that's what that is, is a stream of subatomic particles when you have an unstable isotope. Now, here's the trick. We can use that unstable isotope to date the rock. Right, because what's happening here is if you have an unstable isotope, one element is turning into another element. And we can use that ratio of one element to another to figure out how old the rock is. So let's take a look at how. So let's start with basketball. See, normally it would be March Madness. Basketball would be awesome, right? We canceled it, right? Better that than, you know, people dying. So, definitely. So, but let's think about a basketball tournament, or let's think about any sports tournament, right? And so, let's say that we're going to have a tournament, and we're going to start with 64 teams. So, here's the trick, though, right? Uh, of the, Every time we play a round of, let's just say, basketball, um, half of those teams 
turn into something else, right? Losers, right? Just like, uh, you know, in, with our unstable isotope, that element is turning into something else, right? Maybe that uranium is turning into lead or that carbon is turning into nitrogen or whatever, okay? And so, yeah, and so so if we can see, we see here, I begin with 64 teams. After one round of play, I'm down to 32, right? Half my teams turned into losers, right? So now I've got 32 left. After two rounds of play, I've got 16 because half of my 32 turned into losers, right? After three rounds of play, I'm down to eight. After four, I'm down to four. After five, I'm down to two, right? And so, yeah, so every round of play, I lose half of my winning teams because they turn into losing teams okay so we don't need to do it with numbers we can do it with percentages right and so i begin with 100 percent of my teams after one round i'm down to 50 after two i'm down to 25 after three i'm down to 12 and a half after four 6.2 after five so, you know three right so let's just go 12 six three right and so every round of play i lose half of my team so the number of you know winning teams goes down right now notice if i don't know what round it is but i know how many teams i have left or what percentage i have left I'll know what round it is, right? If I say, so, hey, what round is that tournament in? And say, so, well, there's 25% of the teams left. Okay, well, that means that that two rounds have passed, right? So if I don't know this column, I can figure it out from that column, right? After 50, if 50% 50 are left, one round has passed. If 25% are left, two rounds have passed. If 12 are left, three rounds have passed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, now let's think about rocks right now rather than winning or losing teams we have a parent isotope which is unstable and it is turning into a daughter isotope which is stable right and so um and so you have an unstable parent this is like our winning team okay and then it's going to turn into this daughter isotope right it's going to it's going to radioactively decay okay so i've got one thing turning into another just like oh i've got winning teams turning into losing teams i've got a parent isotope turning into a daughter isotope now rather than a round of play in a sports tournament though i've got something called a half-life because radioactive radiometric decay works the same way you start out with a hundred percent parent and then after one half-life 50 percent of that parent has turned into daughter product so i've got 50 percent parent left after another half-life 50 percent has, has turned into the daughter so i have 25 percent left after three half lives i have 12 after four i have six after five, I have three, right? Every half-life, you lose half of your parent isotope. Now, now, it's, now, now, now keep this in mind. It's not like after one half-life, you lose half. After two half-lives, you lose the other half. No, no, no. You lose half of what's left. Hold on, i got to cough. <coughs> so, drink a little water. Good to go. Okay, so. Um, so right, so so once again, it's not like one half life takes out half of your, you know, parent, and then the other, the next half life takes out the other half. No, you lose half of what's left, right? So you're constantly having what you have, right? So you go from a hundred to fifty to twenty-five to twelve to six to three to one and a half, et cetera, et cetera, right? Got to cough again. <coughs> so, okay, so so let's take a look. So let's not do it this way. Let's do it another way. So when we start now when do we start when does this process start well that's a good question the process starts when the igneous rock cools okay um below what we call a barrier temperature and it becomes a um a closed system right so um so really this works best on igneous rock or minerals directly durable minerals from igneous rock like zircons and things like that right and so really this works best on igneous rock you can't really normally radiometrically date sandstone 
okay that's a sedimentary rock right you really really want to be doing this on igneous rock okay so so we begin with 100 percent uh parent okay then after one half life we're down to 50 percent parent right after two half lives half of what's left turns into something else right my, my mouse is freezing up there we go half of what's left turns into something else so now we're down to 25 percent parent right after three half life we lose half again we're down to 12 and a half after four we lose half again and we're down to six etc etc but we could even go down to three something right and so you can see what this curve looks like this is a uh, this is a logarithmic curve. This is a lot like what we're experiencing right now with the rise of uh, COVID-19 just in reverse. Um, in this case, it's going down exponentially, not up exponentially. And so, um, so yeah, so so there's a curve. So now, you know, what if it's one and a half half lives, right? Or you know, what if it's you know, thirty percent, right? So, so with the curve, you can do in between my 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 even number or my round number half lives here, right? And so, okay, so so you know, so you bring me a, or we we look at a rock and you know we figure out that it's twenty five percent parent, uh, seventy five percent daughter, and so we say, how old is it? Well, it's two half lives old. Well, that's not helpful, <laughs> right? Because you know. Yeah, that's not an answer, right? Well, how old is the rock? Three and a half half lives. Okay, no, right? That's not that's not an answer. Not yet. What we need to know is how long is a half life, right? Well, it varies. How long a half life is actually varies with what isotope you use, right? What chemical are you looking at? Some half lives are very very long. Other half lives. Not so much, right? You've probably heard of carbon dating, right? Let's carbon date it. Carbon date this. Carbon date that. Car. Okay, that's fine. Carbon is an un. Carbon fourteen is an unstable isotope of carbon. Not all carbon is unstable, but some of it is. It decays into nitrogen fourteen. It has a half life of about five thousand seven hundred thirty years. Okay, this makes carbon fourteen very very useful for relatively recent things, right? Things that are thousands of years old, right? The problem is if your thing is hundreds of millions or billions of years old, there's no carbon left, right? You're all the way out here on this curve. There's hardly any carbon left, certainly none that you can detect. So now you need a different isotope. If you're working with things that are hundreds of millions of years old, uranium-235 is a great option because it decays to lead-207 with a half-life of about 713 million years, right? And so if I find uh, something that is, you know, half uranium-235, half lead-207, it's 50-50, that's one half-life. 1 times 713 million is, oddly enough, 713 million. Great, it's 713 million years old, right? If you're in here somewhere, it's a little younger. If you're down here, it's a little older. Um, if it was two half-lives, right? If we looked at the rock and it was 25% uh, uranium-235 and 75% lead-207, that would put us here on the graph, and that would mean we would need to go two times 713 million which would be about 1.4 billion right and so you know that's a re you know uranium-235 is a really good isotope for things that are hundreds of millions uh to you know to you know uh, a few billion years old if something's really old uh you might want to use uranium-238 right a different isotope of uranium that has a half-life of four and a half billion years old, right? Which, um, which is a coincidentally the age of the Earth, right? And so, you know, the very, very oldest rocks and the very, very oldest crystals and whatnot that we have on the Earth, um, if you measure the uranium-238 and the lead-206, it's about 50-50. It's a, it's all about 50-50, about one half life, because that's that's you know that's how old the Earth is, right? And so yeah, so um here's what here's what the labs that look that do this look like. This is a modern mass spectrometer, unlike that that line that that Claire Patterson had to run. So now you can just put a rock in one end and it'll and tune it 
tell it what isotope you want to use, and it'll spit it out the other end and tell you what the ratio of parent to daughter is, right? And so, if we want to summarize this idea of radiometric dating, we say, okay, look, some isotopes are stable, right? When an isotope is unstable, it decays at a known rate that we call a half-life. A half-life is the time it takes for half of an element to decay, right? So after one half-life, you're down to, you know, 50% parent, 50% daughter. After two, you're at, you know, 25, 75. After three, you're at 12, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so if you want to figure out how old a rock is, an igneous rock, like I said, this really works best on igneous rocks, measure the amount of parent and daughter isotope you have, right? Determine how many half-lives have passed, and then multiply the number of half-lives by the length of a half-life, right? And so if I go back to my graph, measure the amount of parent and daughter isotope you have. So let's say you have 2575, right? Figure out how many half-lives have gone by. Well, if it's 2575, that's two half-lives, right? And then multiply the length of a half-life by the number of half-lives. So if I used potassium argon with a half-life of 1.3 billion years, 2 times 1.3 billion is 2.6 billion, and so that rock is 2.6 billion years old, okay? Alrighty, so, um, you know, like, this is this is one of my field sites, and, you know, you can see that, you know, you've got a layer here, uh, you know, of this little white stuff. You see here, okay, so here's a cross-bedded sandstone, here's some volcanic ash, but look right in the middle of that coal here, right in the middle of that coal, right? That's an ash layer. Ash counts. Ash counts as igneous rock for these purposes. And so I date that ash layer, right? I know how old that ash layer is. That means I know how old that coal bed is. So if I find that same coal bed somewhere else without the ash layer in it, I know how old the coal bed is. I know how old the fossils in that coal bed are. And so if I find those fossils again, I know how old that coal bed is. I, you know, superposition tells me that sandstone has to be younger than that number. This stuff down here has to be older than that number. And suddenly I've got a really nice time marker there. And so, you know, with enough of those, enough of those, we can gradually work it out, right? You can gradually figure out um you know how old rock is um and then you know this is younger that's older and you you can, you can work it out i mentioned carbon dating um you know carbon dating because it has the carbon rather because it has a half-life of five thousand years five thousand seven hundred thirty years um really sixty thousand years is about as far back as you can go with carbon uh archaeologists love carbon they'll use carbon for all kinds of things right Paleontologists and geologists, we don't really use carbon. Now, all our stuff is way too old, right? But, you know, if we're using, once again, if we're using carbon, we are way out here on that curve. If you're dealing with something that is millions of years old and that thing only has a half-life of 5,000, let's say 6,000 years, you're all, there's no carbon left. It's gone. At least no carbon-14 left. And so, and so, yeah. Um, so, we don't need that. And... Dead. Don't worry. I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, so, okay, um, let's go back to the exercise real quick, and let me show you something. Exercise, exercise, there we are. Okay, so, I give you two charts and a few, one, two, what I got, four sorts of, um, you know, word problems here, right? And so, let me show you how to do this. Okay, so I tell you up here. Look at the question, right? Based on the percentages given in the question, use chart one to figure out how many half-lives have passed. Why doesn't it like half-lives? It doesn't like that word for some reason. Okay, fine. We'll hyphenate it. Why doesn't it load out like past? Okay, so um, so percentages, you uh, blah, 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 figure out how many half-lives have passed, right? Look at the question again for the isotope and read off how long a half-life is multiply the number of half-lives by the length of a half-life. Let me show you. Let's do number, let's do the second one. The first one is kind of trivial. So let's do the second one, okay? So the second one says a rock is 25% carbon-14 and 75% nitrogen, okay? So I look at the chart. So the parent, so carbon-14 is the parent, nitrogen-14 is the daughter, right? And so I look at the chart. 2575. Well, let's find 2575 on this chart, and there it is. Okay. Um, 
And so, so 2575, that tell, and then I look over here and it says two half lives have passed, right? And so, in our little math here, two half lives have passed, okay? We're going to multiply that to, I'll use an X, we're going to multiply that to, let's use a lowercase x, we're going to multiply that, that, that number of half lives by the length of a half life, right? And so, if I do that, I now now I need to look over here to find out how long a half life is, right? Okay, what isotope are we using? We're using carbon fourteen, right? Carbon fourteen is right here. Okay, so uranium, uranium, potassium, carbon. Okay, so we're using carbon fourteen. Carbon fourteen has a half life of five thousand seven hundred thirty years, right? So two times five thousand seven hundred thirty that equals a number. I don't know what. 10, 11,460 or something like that. Okay, so so two times that equals a number, and that number is your answer. Okay, uh, so once again, look at the percentages. In this case, it's 2575. Figure out how many half lives have gone by. Okay, in this case, it's two. Then look at the isotope. Figure out how to use this chart. Figure out how long a half-life is. Multiply. Let me see if I can get fancy here. Multiply. Oh, I can't. Okay. Multiply that 2 in this case by that 5,730 in this case. That gives you that number, and that number is the answer. Okay. So, um, go ahead, and there's what? The first one is trivial. 50, 50. That's one half-life. Okay. Uh, then 12.5. And then 70.7, .7, right? Find those numbers on here. That'll tell you how many half-lives have gone by. Use the isotopes. Figure out how long a half-life is. Multiply those two numbers together. And that's how old the rock is. Okay, so, uh, so go ahead and, you know, do this one if you haven't already. And then do, do the, the, you know, the three remaining radiometric dating problems. And that will wrap us up for geology. Okay. Um, I have honestly not written the test yet. Um, I'm, um, I'm working on it. <laughs> or I'm working on getting to it. So when I do, though, I will post up a little bit more of a review. But study the review sheet, right? Just like the previous test. Study the review sheet, study the notes, right? That's the key to success. Even with the upcoming open book, open note, open whatever tests that you're about to take, the key to that will still be study the review sheet, okay? Um, so go ahead and, you know, figure out a way to type your answers up here. You guys are smart. You can figure that out. And then, uh, and then when you get this done, go ahead and turn it in and give me a day or two and I will get it graded. All right, guys? Okay, um, there, there it is. There's the geology. Hooray, geology. Alrighty, um, the next thing you'll see from me will probably be a video um, talking a little bit more about the test once I write it. If you have any issues, let me know. Shoot me an email. Okay, bye-bye, guys.